the, this old house series. Although today we're taking a break from old houses and we're going to talk about an old boat, a boat you all know, the HMS Discovery. And presenting this is um, John Horton and his wife Mary. And it's in celebration of the, it was, uh, this book was written in a celebration of Captain Hoover in 1992. So, um, if you wish to buy a book, there's going to be, the Historical Society is going to buy a, uh, an amount. It will be available at the Blue Heron Art Gallery through Kitty, Do um, not Kitty Doyle. So, and there's a sign-up sheet for you if you need to sign up and, uh, and if you want to buy them. Samples here, and if you buy one of these books, you get one of these free. Okay, so John is a well-known artist of marine art, and with no further fanfare, I'm turning it over to John. Thank you, John. <laughs> Good afternoon everybody, thank you for coming out on such a, a warm day, I'm sure you'd rather be in the garden, picking <coughs> black rose or something. Anyway, um, Mary and I are very glad to be here, we only live across the border on the other side there, and um, we stay there with all you lovely people from our lofty position up in Tawasana. So, anyway, I'm going to talk to you today about um, Captain George Vancouver, and uh, we will find out um, uh, who the man was, um, all about the voyage of discovery, and um, and uh, it is all illustrated with paintings that I have done um, over the years. Um, as you know, I took um, Captain Vancouver sort of under my under my wing, as it were. It is much that I became quite quite obsessed with the fact that Vancouver's name has been blackened over the years. And, and it overshadowed his achievements, his great achievements. And so, um, what we're going to do here is to try and put some of that to right. Now, this um, this painting of um, Captain Vancouver uh, is the only known picture. Although there is even some discussion about whether this really is Vancouver. The painting resides in the National Portrait Gallery in London, and because it is unsigned, we don't know who the artist was. And because it is untitled, um, there's a lot of speculation that, uh, that it may not be, but there's an awful lot of evidence in this painting that says that it, it is in fact in Vancouver. The first is, it's a, it's a naval officer in, in, um, in naval uniform, and you will notice that he's got a double chin. That in itself is slightly telling, because Vancouver suffered from an iodine deficiency. And if anybody has any medical background, you will know that that can cause a goiter underneath and in the throat. And this is something that Vancouver suffered from. The other, the other telling thing is that over on the, uh, on the far side there, um, in the, on the globe, um, if you really study it, you will notice that it depicts the Pacific Northwest. Now, why would, a, why would there be a chart of Pacific Northwest on a painting done in the late 1700s when, um, because when Vancouver came here, the, uh, this area had not been charted. It was a blank, it was a blank sheet of paper. And so um, those, those pieces of evidence really make us think that this is, in fact, the port of the captain Vancouver. He was born in Kings Lynn in Norfolk in, in the UK. Uh, June the 22nd, 2nd and 1757, and he went to sea at the tender age of 15, <coughs> and um, learned his trade, and in fact served with Cook, and was with Cook <coughs> in the Pacific as a young midshipman when Cook was murdered in the Hawaiian Islands. <coughs> and there's a rather telling little point here about the character of the, of the lad, even at this tender age, when Cook was murdered, the chiefs came, came out the following day to the ship and they asked to speak to the young Mr. Vancouver. Now, with all the crew and the officers that were on board the ship, why on earth would they want to speak to a young man? And it's believed that it's because 
Vancouver, they, they thought Vancouver was the one person on board who understood what happened and why it happened. This tells me that Vancouver had in fact gained the confidence of the native people, that he treated them with respect and they treated him with respect in return. <coughs> This would lay him in, in very good stead for when he came later, all those years later, when he came back um, uh, up into the, uh, into the Pacific Northwest later, um, in command of Discovery, he had little, if any, trouble with, uh, with native people. And I think because he treated them with the same level of respect. And as I said, his first commission was with Cook as a young midshipman. Vancouver's father was uh, a customs <coughs> officer in King's Lynn, which was a very respected job in those days. Uh, King's Lynn was a major port on the east coast of the UK, trading um, a, a lot with Europe. Uh, they, they came out of, of Holland, a lot of the ships came out of Holland who traded across to the UK. And uh, because of uh, his father's position, he was able to get him aboard Cook's ship as a young bishopman. And of course that meant that he was able to, of course Cook was one of the, one of the first great cartographers of the world. Um, nobody could, could, at that time, could create a chart more accurately than, than Captain James Cook. And of course the young, the young Mr. Vancouver learned his trade of cartography from Cook. Um, he did have a great naval career in as much that um, he achieved um, great things. But it was not. Unfortunately, you will see that he died in obscurity in, on May 12, 1798. Um, and we say, well, why did he die in obscurity after doing all the great things that he did? One of the reasons was that there, when Vancouver was sent to this coast, <clears throat> he had a young naval officer on board, a young midshipman, by the name of Thomas Pitt. And Thomas Pitt became the bane of Vancouver's life. He was an aristocrat. His uncle was William Pitt, the Prime Minister of England and the First Lord of the Admiralty. So you could say that young Thomas <coughs> Pitt was kind of well connected. The problem was that he was, to put it bluntly, a naughty boy. He was always getting into trouble. And because of this, Vancouver had to uh, discipline. Now he wouldn't flog him like he would a common sailor, but he could cane him, just like I got caned when I was a naughty boy at school. <coughs> and um, but the young Pitt didn't like this. In fact, he um, he thought that uh, Vancouver was overstepping his bounds because Vancouver was a commoner and he was an aristocrat. <coughs> How dare he punish an aristocrat? The position got so bad that Vancouver actually made the biggest mistake of his life because he put him on another ship and sent him back to England to get him off the ship. With the result that the young Thomas Pitt, when he got back to England, he went to all his aristocratic friends and uh, started um, telling them what a terrible man Vancouver was, he was treating his men badly, he was doing this, he was doing that, he was doing the other and he was a terrible man and he shouldn't have been sent out on the voyage in the first place. By the time that Vancouver got back to England, his name was so blackened that he could not um, speak to the, his, aristocratic, uh, his aristocratic friends who had nominated him for the, for the trip, um, didn't want to know. And so this was the reason that he actually ended up dying in obscurity. There's a, there's a side note to this, and that was that Vancouver kept on going, as you will see in a minute, Vancouver kept on going back to Hawaii when he, when he was up here on the coast, he kept going back to, Vancouver, to Hawaii every winter because the weather was so bad here, he, he couldn't do the work that he'd been set up to do. And so he would go back to Hawaii to, um, for R&R &R for his crew and to replenish the vessels and repair the vessels and get everybody back into good health so they could re return and, and carry on with their work the following year. Vancouver was responsible for helping to unite all the islands of Hawaii under one flag, <clears throat> under one chief. <clears throat> and the, the, the king, the new king, 
um, the, dominant, the dominant chief who became the king, um, was so grateful to Vancouver that he gave Vancouver a yellow feather cloak, which was the most precious thing he could give him. And he said, you know, um, we've got some people that, uh, uh, ships that are arriving on, uh, in the islands here, and they are not treating our people very well. <clears throat> and unfortunately, they were American traders. Um, they, were, they, were only, they were only interested in profit, and they didn't care how they treated other people. <clears throat> and they were not treating the native people, and the Hawaiian people, very well. And because Vancouver had obviously um, was having great relations with the, with the new king of, of Hawaii, the king said, you know, I, I know that there's a problem coming down the line, and um, I think what I would like to do is ask your King George to see the Hawaiian Islands under the British flag. I could have gone there on my British passport, I wouldn't have needed it. <laughs> um, but Vancouver was denied access to the king because of the pit problem, and the king, King George, never got the yellow feather cloak, and he never got the request to, to see the Hawaiian Islands under the British flag. However, as you well know, the, the 1700s, the King George um, British flag is in the Hawaiian flag to this day. And that's why it's there. As part of that respect that they had for, for Vancouver. <coughs> now, now, This cease. <coughs> um, this is a drawing which I've actually had the original drawing in my hands. <coughs> this is a drawing of the discovery, 105 feet long, and um, had 105 men on board for the foot for every man. <coughs> it was built on the lines of a Whitby collier. Now Whitby colliers were built um, in Whitby, <coughs> and they used to carry coal from Newcastle up and down the, uh, the, the British East Coast. They were fairly flat bottom, they could take to the, take to the bottom when, when they had to because so many of the ports on the, on the uh, East Coast of the UK um, dry at low tide. When tide goes out, there's no water left in the harbour. And so all of, everything sits on the bottom. And so um, these ships could, could go into port on the high tide Unload their, unload their coal, and on the high side they can go out again. <coughs> um, <coughs> Cook chose the Endeavour, which was also a Whitby collier, because he, de he decided, um, told the Admiralty that this was, the size of the vessel was right for the voyage, and that um, because it was, uh, because of its shape, it could carry for its size a great amount of cargo, which, which if you're going off on a five-year voyage, um, you have to do. And so that's why the Whitney Collars were chosen for these voyages. Not big ships, but, um, but very capable. How does that compare to the bounty? About the same. same. Almost the same. <clears throat> very similar. <clears throat> um, this is a schematic of the world chart and it shows Vancouver's voyage. Now Vancouver, of course, had been with Cook and Cook had landed <clears throat> at Nooka Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and he acclaimed, in 1778, and he acclaimed the land in the name of King George. After they had left, the Spaniards started to make inroads up from Mexico, and they also claimed the land for, for Spain. <coughs> and um, it got to a point where Spain said uh, that they wanted to control all of the trade that was done on the west coast. And um, the British traders were starting to go into Nootka Sound, and, uh, and they were being denied access to it by, um, by the Spaniards. Of course, great profits could be made by, by trading for the other pelts, which could then be taken ch to China for, for, for a big reward. And, um, and so Britain, Britain saw this as a, not just as a, as a Nootka problem, but as a Pacific problem. If, if Spain was going to start laying claims to the Pacific, um, that could deny Britain to, to, to its uh, wish to trade uh, worldwide. 
And so they actually set aside £22,000 to fight a war against Spain for Nook Cassell. Now, £22,000 is about millions in today's money. <coughs> um, but the problem was they didn't have a chance to coach. And so what they did is they, they, they commissioned Vancouver to come round, round here to the Pacific coast and to chart the coast so that they could say they had a piece of paper on which they had a chart which they could draw a line and say we claim the coast from here to here. All it was was a black piece of paper at that time with just spotty little charts that the Spanish were, were not good chart makers. Um, they were doing small, small little rough, rough charters which were not very accurate. <clears throat> and of course Cook had done a running survey up off the coast but he had not done a detailed survey. And so, and also here you can see where, um, where they came around the world <coughs> from Britain, they came to Hawaii and then they kept going backwards and forwards as I said, ending up the last year going up to Cook and then coming back down and then uh, their way back, back to the UK. <coughs> Now, this is the great chart, Vancouver's great chart. Of course, it was made up of many smaller ones, but this is the chart that he compiled of the Pacific Northwest. Now, you have to realize that this chart was done from the ship's boats and from the ships in three summers. Three summers. And uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenon, when you think that the, the, the lack of instruments that they had compared with today, that was all done by manual survey. And one of the things you had to do was you had to, um, on your piece of paper, you had to have a datum, a place to start. And you did that by, by astronom astronomical sightings, and you would say, okay, this is, this is our latitude and longitude um, from Greenwich. And then from there, you would measure by horizontal angles with a sextant. It's all done by trigonometry, and you all, all remember trigonometry from school, don't you? <coughs> um, it's all done by trigonometry, and that's the result. Was, was the, was that chart. Now, I came to Canada in 1966, and um, I started boating here a few years later, and I can remember buying charts that still had depths on some of the inlets and it had on the bottom of the chart that these depths had been recorded by Captain George Vancouver. They had never been checked. In 1966, some of the depths of some of the inlets on this coast were still attributed to Captain Vancouver. <coughs> right. Um, what you're going to see now is um, a series of paintings uh, which illustrate the, uh, the trip. And we're going to start at <coughs> Cape Flattery. <coughs> this is Cape Flattery to Touche Island uh, uh, at, the, at the entrance to um, the One Fuel Strait. <coughs> now, when Vancouver was with Cook, when they approached the coast, they went in on the other side of Touche Island on the south side of Tatouche Island. And when they tacked out, forced out by heavy weather, um, when, they, when, they, when Cook turned in to shore again the following day, they were off Nook Cassell. And that is why Cook missed the entrance by nip and tuck. He missed the entrance to the one piece of All right. Now, when Vancouver came up, um, there's, a, there's a rock there called Pillar Rock. And when Vancouver saw that, he remembered having seen that rock and he knew exactly where he was. I've been here before. Okay? <clears throat> now, the, the, that night they, they were actually went in under an inner gale into, into uh, the wonderful Strait. And that night they found a, a, an anchorage off of Nia Bay. <clears throat> and the following day they weighed anchor and they sailed up the wonderful Strait. This painting shows the Chatham, which was 68 feet long and was the consort to the discovery. Um, she was at what they called it apple cheek, that is very round in the bell. She was purported to not be a very good sailor, 
but it was funny how very often she asked her to discover it. <coughs> These are the Olympic, Olympic um, mountains, and this position is roughly off of Victoria. <coughs> and um, in his log, he said the weather, the weather cleared, and they had a most pleasant sail that's in back of his log. <coughs> now, Discovery Bay is, um, is at the east end of the Juan de Fuca Strait, and on the Port Townsend is on the other side of that of that high land on the on the right hand side there. <coughs> Discovery Bay was Vancouver's first serious anchorage. They did they did anchor off of uh, Dungeness. And by the way, a lot of these names are names that Vancouver left. Right? <coughs> they were places. They were people um, and and, and commemorating occasions. That, uh, that Vancouver left. There's actually 300, there's about 385 names that we use every day of our lives that Vancouver left <laughs> on the coast. Mount Baker is one of them. <clears throat> Mount Rainier is another. Mount Hood is another. All named after Admirals. Admirals E. Inlet. And he named this Discovery Bay after a ship. <clears throat> and he named that island off of there Protection Island because it protected the harbour. That bay was big enough to put the whole of the United States Pacific Fleet in, in the Second World War. It's a big bay, and it's very deep. But Vancouver, um, and Vancouver went in there. Now, I've been in there in my own vessel, and I've anchored right here, and this little spit of land is exactly the way that Vancouver left it today. It hasn't changed whatsoever. <clears throat> and Vancouver would put a a, a, a little account in camp on there, and um, they would um, take the gunpowder ashore to try it out because it used to get damp on the ship. And uh, they might take the, uh, the, the portable, they had a portable forge which they would take ashore, and the blacksmith would repair and make new fittings for the, for the vessel. <coughs> There's also this little pointed tent. Now, that little pointed tent is actually an observatory. And it was full of scientific equipment, and also this was how they found their datum. Remember when we talked about datums? Well, that would be the datum that he would that he would make, and from there he would do all his horizontal angles. That tent, if you go to the Greenwich Maritime Museum, they had that tent in the cook room with all of the astronomical instruments that were inside it. Still, still exists. <coughs> So Vancouver, when he got to this point, Vancouver discovered very, very quickly that this was a very convoluted area that he was going into. He was not going to be able to do the surveys from the, sh from the ships themselves, what they called a running survey, where they would take angles from the ship itself and measure distance off and measure distances to points and, and do it that way. That would be a running survey. They were going to have to use the small ship's boats. And so he left the ships at Anchor here with the crew on board and then sent all the ships boats out and they went down to the Hood Canal, which is exactly the name, Admiralty Inlet. And they went all the way down uh, as far as Olympia. Okay? Charting, not charting the whole area. And this was going, this set the course for the way that they were going to have to do all of their charting from here on in. It was all going to be done from the from the ship's boats. <clears throat> now that is Mount Rainier in the background, and this is Restoration Point. Vancouver named it Restoration Point because he anchored just around the corner on the anniversary of the British, the the re-establishment of the British monarchy, the restoration of the British monarchy. All right, so he named it Restoration Point. There's another place up the coast that he did a following year when they were anchored on the same day and they called it Restoration Cove right, for, the same, for the same reason. <clears throat> so this is just about opposite Seattle. Right? So they had taken the boats down as that far. Now you remember these are square rig vessels. They don't have they don't have engines in them. There's only two ways of moving these vessels. One is to sail it and the other one is to tow it using the using all power with the ships with the ship's boats. And very often that's what they had to do. <clears throat> so to work these ships down uh, down as far as <coughs> Seattle even was uh, was quite an accomplishment. <clears throat> now Port Susan, um, 
uh, on, the way, on the way back up, um, they were going into Port Susan when, um, in, in fog actually, and Chatham was asked to, to lead the way, and the bottom suddenly came up and Chatham ran aground. <coughs> and um, it so often happens, you know, here in, on this coast, especially if it's the mouth of a river, you'll get all the, all the till coming down and then the bottom will suddenly come up or one minute you're sailing in, in deep water and the next minute you're very shallow. And that's what happened here. And um, so the ship, the ship then, the tide went out, the ship was left dry, and they would use an occasion like this to help um, do repairs on the vessel. <coughs> the vessel was covered in copper on the bottom, copper sheeting. <coughs> copper sheeting was to, was to stop Torito worms from eating the wood, because wooden, wooden vessels are, are, get eaten up very quickly <coughs> by Torito worms. Today we put anti fouling paint on the bottom of the vessel. They didn't have anti fouling paint. They had something which was actually far better, sheets of copper. And they, they, would, they would cover that. But if it got damaged in any way, it was a, it was a place where Torito worms could get in. And you, you've, seen, you've seen logs on the beach with all these holes in? That's Torito worms. That's what they are. <clears throat> you can imagine that on the bottom of your boat. Your boat wouldn't float for very long. Right? <clears throat> And so what would happen here is when they, one of the places where it would get damaged would be when they raised the anchor. If the anchor, if the, if the bill of the anchor was to cut into the, into the, um, the copper, it could punch a hole, good place for a tree to want to go into, all right? Sorry to interrupt, whoever's car the silver Mercedes in front of the fire patch, you're gonna have to ask him to move your car. It's blocking our access to the uh, And so uh, what they're doing here is they're laying the anchor, anchors out to, so they can pull the, pull the boat off um, when, the tide, when the tide returns. Now, um, this is in Rosario Strait. And this was actually a commission painting uh, of the two vessels by an architect who uh, was building a, um, a house up on the, on the cliff top. <clears throat> and he knew that Captain Vancouver's ships anchored right down below where his house was. And so he asked me to do this painting um, of the two ships at anchor right in that, right in that spot. <clears throat> so as they started to move up the coast, now as I said, these, these vessels could only be moved by wind or by rowing, and the other way was to let them drift on the tide. But if the tide turned in against you, uh, that wasn't going to help you at all. So you would have to anchor. But, um, you know, anchoring on this coast is not an easy thing. Sometimes you're in extremely deep water. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, you know you, you may, you may not be maybe too deep to anchor at all. Um, but another thing that can happen is it can be very very rocky, and anchors don't necessarily always hold very well in rock on rocky bottoms, especially some places where you get all these lovely round rocks, and then the anchors just drag over the bottom of it. And Bangkok had quite a lot of trouble with that, and uh, even anchor, one anchor even got lost because it did hang up in the rock. And, when they tried to break it out, the, uh, the anchor broke and they lost it. <clears throat> now, um, we're getting now very close to where we are today. <clears throat> That's Mount Baker in the background. And uh, you're looking at right across into Semiamo Bay at uh, where White Rock is. And over on the far side here, you'll see two ships at anchor. And those are Vancouver's two ships. <clears throat> now. One of the things that, of course, Vancouver had been sent over here to sit to do was to negotiate with the Spaniards to return the right, uh, the, the, the British claim, back to them. <clears throat> and um, the Spaniards themselves were starting to make inroads uh, here on the coast. And these two schooners, the Sutil and the Mexicana, were both built in San Blas. They were, they were 50, 51, 52 feet long <clears throat> and um, built in San Blas. And uh, they, were, they were coming up on, on Spanish exploration. And in the night, they sailed past the, the two British ships that were at anchor. <coughs> and um, Vancouver would meet with them later. Now, this painting, and by the way, um, if anybody is interested, we do have a supply of limited edition prints of this painting, because that is the, that's the high land on the, over, over on the far side here of. Um, of the point, and this is Vancouver leaving his ships at anchor, 
sailing up, <coughs> up the coast, where he would uh, go up eventually up into what is now Vancouver Harbor and, uh, and, uh, and further up, and, and then return to his ships. <coughs> but this is them actually leaving the ships in what he called Mud Bay, <coughs> and um, uh, sailing up on that, on that particular voyage. So um, these are the small boats leaving the ships early in the morning. Their morning would start about 4 o'clock in the morning, and they would then, if they could, they would stop at about 8 o'clock in their breakfast, and then they would continue on. And um, sometimes uh, th their days were 16, 18 hour days. They were long, long, long days. And of course they had to, they, they sometimes they could sail boats, but very often they were, they were rowing them. <coughs> so this is, the, uh, this is the ships, and that is Paul Roberts in the background. Now, there's some discussion, I've been doing a little bit of extra reading lately, about the point and the relationship of what the point was, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> And it's interesting to note that the Spaniards called it an island. Vancouver called it a point. But in fact, I believe that it was theoretically still an island. Because 10,000 years ago, the sea went as far as Langley. Right? Delta, all this, all this low land here, the Del Delta and Richmond, that was nothing but a marsh. So it was covered in high water. And this was actually called, at one time, Roberts Island. Right? Because it, it did, at high water, it had water all the way around it. And believe me or not, it's going to happen again. <laughs> <coughs> you know, we're talking about a nine, nine foot rising water level. Anybody who lives down on the point, you better start moving. Put your hands up on the market now. Right? You'll get more money if you ask before the flood, and you will after. <laughs> <coughs> and so, actually, Vancouver sailed up. They actually went over to Belvedere Island on the, uh, on the far side because he kept getting forced out by shallow water. This was Robert's Bank. All right? Shallow water. Even in the small rowboats, they kept running around. So they kept getting pushed out and pushed out. Now, you can imagine being in a small rowboat, like they were. You know, your own, your eye level is only here. <coughs> and you're looking inland, and you, you've got this huge marsh. There are no trees, because they don't grow in the water. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. You can't see land, but you can see the mountains. And he called it Delta-like country. He believed that there was a big river coming up with it, which of course was the Fraser River. But, <clears throat> but he kept getting forced out. And, and the bank goes out five miles from today's dike. That's a long way. Right? And, if, and remember, the rest of it, all the way to New Westminster, was <coughs> marshland. So um, anyway, they ended up over on Valdez Island. <coughs> And then they, they, when they came back, they landed um, at where the university, the U University of British Columbia is. <clears throat> they landed on what we today know as Wreck Beach, and uh, they called it Breakfast Point. <laughs> they stopped there for breakfast, <clears throat> and uh, um, there weren't any nudes there in those days, otherwise they'd stay longer, I'm sure. <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, from there, after breakfast, they continued on into the inlet, <coughs> and they, they went into the narrows, and this is the entrance to what we now know as Brad, Brad Inlet, which Vancouver named, the Rad's Inlet. <coughs> that is Grouse Mountain, which he thought would be a good ski resort. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, this is where the, uh, this is where the um, Bartlemore Shopping Centre is, and he also thought it would be a good place for a shopping centre one day down the line. Um, this, of course, is Sidewatch Rock, and the, the legend is that um, this was a, a native who, um, for his um, kindness, was actually turned to stone. I don't know why that what computes anyway. But if you can see here, there's a, a man there with his, with his arms folded. Right, that's so much rock. Of course, you can walk all around here now the, the, the sea wall. Right. <coughs> There's some smoke in the background. Are those um, that would be the village. Okay. Um, they, they're burning trees down the Parkour Shopping Centre. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's where the village was at the mouth of the river. 
And uh, of course, all these natives, they all, they all came out from that village and met Vancouver, and they traded peacefully. Vancouver then continued on up through the inlet, uh, went up uh, as far as Port Moody, and then returned out, went up into Howe Sound, which he named, all the points and islands, he all named all of those, and then continued on up, uh, up uh, sea shelf, up as far as Pender, Pender Harbour, turned back, and, uh, and returned uh, to his ships. Now, on the way back, <coughs> when he was coming down off Point Ray, he noticed two ships at anchor. And, wait, and he thought, oh, that's funny. Um, maybe they've, uh, they've we've been away rather a long time. Maybe they, they've brought the ships up looking for us. When he got closer, he noticed it was two Spanish ships. All right? Now, when he, they went alongside and um, um, Quadro Valdez, they, they, were, they were welcomed on board, they were given breakfast and a great friendship, even though there was a lot of, uh, you know, animosity between uh, the countries over Nooka, <coughs> um, they, a big friendship actually, um, a gu I should say a guarded friendship, um, started up. And uh, it was decided that Vancouver would go back, pick his ships up, and they would rendezvous off the point here and continue the voyage north together. <clears throat> One of the reasons Vancouver wanted to do that was, I can keep an eye on it. All right, I can keep an eye on it. Because Vancouver's orders were to chart the continental shoreline, the continental shoreline, the mainland, not the islands that lay off. He was terribly interested in the islands. Because also they had said to him, oh, while you're up there, um, if you happen to trip across a trip fresher water that might be the Northwest Passage, that wouldn't be a bad idea either. Right. So he was also looking for the Northwest Passage. Any of these inlets could have, could have gone through the continent to, uh, to provide that, that passage. <clears throat> anyway, so Vancouver joined the, with the Spaniards and they continued, they continued north. Now this is a brand new painting. Uh, you're only in the second one group to see this. Uh, I just did this as a commission, I uh, delivered it to the client yesterday actually, um, and it's the Discovery, the Chatham, and the two Spanish vessels in Desolation Sound. Vancouver named it Desolation Sound because it was, he found it to be a very desolate spot. There were no fish that year, so he didn't, they couldn't catch any fish, but he found very little wildlife. <coughs> Not even, not even many birds. <clears throat> they called it Desolation Sound. <clears throat> um, they, they had drifted in on, uh, on, with very little wind in the middle of the night and they drifted around to and fro inside the sound there, um, not quite knowing where they were. And then they, they finally managed to drop anchor behind Kinghorn Island. And the following day they sent the boats out to, uh, to reconnoitre and they found a much better anchorage in Tikanan what became known as Tikan Arm. And so this painting actually shows the vessels, they're just, they're just weighing anchor. Um, there was a gale blowing, although they're in the protection of, of, um, of King Horn Island, so the sea isn't that big. <coughs> and um, uh, the vessels are weighing anchor. Um, Discovery has just weighed anchor. She's not really moving yet. She's sort of going more sideways. On, and she's just making her turn to port here to follow Chatham down towards um, Tegan Island. <coughs> That's really the story behind that one. This is another uh, picture of them in Desolation Sound. Um, and you can see here the vessel uh, being towed by the ship's boat. Right, the other way of moving them. Right. Hard work, but uh, it's possible. <coughs> once, and once you've got a ship moving, it, it's, it's amazing uh, how easy it is. Um, I. I even with my own vessel, which is a 52 foot powerboat with only one engine in it, I, I actually um, was able to um, tow a tug and barge on one occasion, and um, it weighed about uh, 10,000 tons. And I actually towed it for five hours, and uh, we went about, we weren't going very fast, we went about five or six miles in that time, but uh, at least we kept them off the rocks anyway. So. <coughs> um, this is, uh, this is off Ca uh, Campbell River, <clears throat> um, on, the, on the, um, the island there opposite Campbell River, and the native village, when Vancouver was there, was up on the cliff top. 
Today, the natives live down here. There's a lighthouse there as well, right down on the, right down on the beach. <coughs> but with rising water levels, maybe they'll go up there again one day. But uh, Vancouver anchored his vessel there and, um, and traded peacefully with the native people. And, but there was a very interesting thing that Vancouver found out at this point, and that was he realized that the land on his port side that we today know as Vancouver Island, and by the way, he named it Vancouver and Quadras Island, that was its original name. <coughs> um, at this point, Vancouver discovered that the rising tide, the flood tide, was no longer coming from the south. It was suddenly coming from the north. And that told him that this land on his port side was an island and the water was coming around both sides and he was roughly halfway around because this was the point where it met. <laughs> Smart though, bricks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get my little digs in. <laughs> okay. Um, after you go through, there's a there's a place where uh, Menzies Bay that he that he named after uh, <coughs> when you when you go past Campbell River, you are in Discovery Passage. I wonder where that name came from. And when you go into Seymour Narrows, there's a there's a bay, big bay in there called Menzies Bay. Menzies was a botanist on board Discovery. Um, that had been put on there to collect all the flora and fauna and seeds and, and record all the botanical things that they, they found on their voyage. <coughs> so Vancouver named it Menzies Bay in his honor. Now, when you go, um, when you, once you've got through um, Seymour Narrows, and unfortunately, that is, in all the, all the reading I've done, I cannot find any reference to going through to how Vancouver got his ships through Seymour Narrows. Of course, in those days, Ripple Rock, that big rock that used to be right in the middle, was still there. Right? And even today, when you go through, um, the water is. I've seen I've seen um, 60 foot logs suck down in a whirlpool and come up like a rocket out of the water. In the, <coughs> very dangerous. Um, vessels still get into trouble in, and they've got engines, you know. He, he had a sailboat, remember? Only two ways to get through there, or three. Go through on the tide, let the tide push you through, which would have been the ebb tide. Um, you know, you could tow it through, which would have been really dodgy, and the other way would the sail through, which would have been impossible. So how they got them through, I don't know. But once you get into Johnson Strait, um, it's only, it's quite narrow, it's only a mile, two miles wide in some places. And these ships can only sail at 60 degrees to the wind when you're tacking in. And in the summertime, which is when they were there, the wind is predominantly from the northwest. And it howls down there at 30, 35 knots every summer afternoon. <coughs> okay, so um, they had to tack. Now, um, I told you that they had problems anchoring sometimes, and sometimes they would be they would be tacking backwards and forwards, and they would uh, be trying to anchor, finding that their anchor didn't hold, and they'd end up further back than they were this morning. They really had a fight getting up from the spread. <coughs> when you uh, get further up, but well, we're almost up to Port Hardy now, and. Um, this is a place called Shimun Sound, um, and we are in a, a bay called O'Brien Bay. And that is the only way in, it's through that little, that, that little hole there. And over here on my left side, there's a narrow isthmus that Vancouver described. He walked, he rode in there and he walks across it in a few minutes. And there is a little trail uh, that goes there between rock and trees and you know when you walk there that you're walking in Vancouver's footsteps because it's the only way you can get across it, across the world's passage. <clears throat> anyway, this is the, this is the boats uh, just showing them exploring there and they would have been, uh, again, you know, working on their charts at the same time. <clears throat> now, um, we're now up to Alert Bay. That is Alert Bay in the <clears throat> over here on the island. And um, the, there's a river right, right opposite here, and Vancouver anchored in behind that 
that rocky inlet there, which is still there. I've anchored there many times. <coughs> and there was a village here at the, at the mouth of the river. And um, over here on, on, on the island was where they buried their dead. And the, the cemetery is still a cemetery to this day for the native people. <coughs> okay. Um, in, of course, you know, there's a small village in there, and the, there is a, a, a big native settlement there in the, in, in the middle. Uh, they've got a wonderful long house in there, big house in there. Um, Mary goes up there for, for big ceremonies sometimes. <coughs> but the houses, there were 35 houses in four streets, as Vancouver described it. And by the way, there are, there are little paintings, which I've got copies of, um, which were done by the young midshipmen on board, because of course they didn't have, they didn't have cameras in those days, they couldn't, they couldn't record things by camera, so what the young gentlemen, the young midshipmen were required to do was to do little paintings of what they saw. And so they would do, a, there was a paint, there's a painting of this village done by sight. <coughs> There's paintings of some of the mountains, some of the, some of the, some of the topography uh, that would later go on to charts and things like that. But um, anyway, Vancouver described this as 35 houses in four streets, and these houses are built out of cedar planks. Now, they couldn't go down to the local home hardware and buy cedar planks to build them. They had to cut them out of trees. <clears throat> now, they didn't have saws. They didn't have iron and steel like we, like we did. <clears throat> How did they make these big, thick planks of cedar? Well, as you may or may not know, cedar has a rather wonderful property, and that is it splits very easily, very evenly. So what they would do is they would go up a tree, and they would cut a groove in it, and they would put um, another piece of wood inside, wedges, and they would split a plank right out of the side of the tree. They would just take one plank out. <clears throat> They'd go and do it to another tree. The tree didn't die. The tree went on growing. All right. He called it selective logging. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, we've got, a lot, we've got a lot we can learn from these people, haven't we? And um, and so that's how they that's how they made the the, uh, the planks out of the, for the for the houses. But not only that, but they were sewn together with cedar rope. The cedar gave the native people everything they needed. They made baskets out of it, they made rope out of it, <coughs> and they, they, would, they would bind them together against these vertical posts. But it was very easy to, to disassemble it very quickly. You could load the whole house into a canoe and take it somewhere else. <coughs> now, um, we're getting up off Port Hardy now, and um, in um, Queen Charlotte Sound, and in fog, Vancouver's ship actually grounded on a rock. And Vancouver actually referred to these rocks as lurking rocks. And if any of you are bozers, you know that on this coast there's an awful lot of lurking rocks waiting for you. Of course, he didn't have a chart like we do to tell us where the rocks are. <coughs> he was finding them either with a leaden line or with his own ship. And on this occasion, uh, they found it with the ship. <coughs> the sound at this point is open to the open ocean, to the Pacific Ocean. And they were very lucky that the swell was very slight. If there had been any great swell running, that ship would have pounded to death in, in very short order. All right? And so um, they, they managed to lay anchors out and uh, Within the, you know, on the next high tide, they did manage to, to float off, but they had to derig the vessel and use the use the spars to prop the ship up. They would also throw overboard everything they could: the, the water, uh, fuel from the galley, which was probably very coal or wood, <coughs> and and things like cannon, which were heavy. They would put those over the side, but they would mark them with a barrel so they could pick it up later on. Right? Um, they did manage to get the ship off. And um, the following day, the same thing happened again, this time to Chatham, and go all through it again. <coughs> they actually, you know, to rig a ship like this takes several weeks. <coughs> um, when they de when they unrigged it to, to do this, 
Um, Vancouver gave his men three hours rest after the ship was refloated, and then they all turned to to re-rig the, 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 the vessel, and within about 10 hours the ship was totally ready to continue its voyage. <coughs> Um, we're now further, a little further up the coast. This is actually Restoration Cove. And uh, Vancouver went in there with, his, with the discovery and he put the ship on the beach, right up here, there's a little stream there. And there's actually an area there which I'm told is completely devoid of rocks. Uh, all the rocks have been cleared. It's, a, it's about 100, 100 feet long and about uh, 30 feet wide. And we believe that that is the spot where Vancouver put his ship, that he cleared all the rocks away at low tide before he put the ship on the beach. <coughs> and um, so this was sort of a, um, if you like, a romantic painting, hopefully in the moonlight, uh, with the ships uh, at anchor after, the, after all the work had been done. Now, at the end of the first year, Vancouver um, managed to get around the top end of Vancouver Island. Now, of course, he knew where Nootka Sound was, um, by latitude and longitude because he had been there with Cook, remember. Um, and so he sailed down to Nootka Sound where he knew that the Spanish were waiting to do the nego their negotiations, continue the negotiations for the return of the Sound to the British flag. And so here is discovery sailing in to, to um, uh, Friendly Cove. There's a Spanish vessel at anchor there. There's a fort where the, where the lighthouse now, now stands. They had a fort there, and they're actually firing a salute. They're not firing in anger, they're firing a salute, <coughs> and Vancouver ships would have replied. Um, we have, the, we have the, uh, the Chatham got in there first. She's already at anchor. Uh, we have the Dauntless. Now, the Dauntless, HMS Asian, Dauntless, was sent from Hawaii <coughs> with uh, supplies to resupply the discovery. That was prearranged. And also a vessel called the Three Brothers of London, which was a British trading vessel, and you see them there um, loading, loading otter pelts from the, that they purchased from the, from the native people. And this is the Spanish pilot helping Vancouver get in into harbour safely. <coughs> um, the Gardner Canal. Now, Admiral Gardner was um, one of Vancouver's great patrons. He was the Admiral that said uh, Vancouver was the man for the job. This is, the, this is who we will send on this voyage. And he named the Gardner Canal after him. <coughs> and um, if, even if you go there today, it looks much like this. Um, the, of course, the, the glaciers have receded somewhat, um, but the water is still a very aqua blue because the glaciers are still up on the top of the, of the mountains, 3,000 3, feet up, and we get these, these wonderful waterfalls coming down from great heights, uh, almost like I remember writing in my log once, the first time I was there, it looks like maiden's hair hanging down the, hanging down the cliff. Uh, that's exactly what it does look like as it, come, as it comes down. <clears throat> of course, all this rock has been polished by ice, because at one time, this was full of ice. Okay. Um, there are places on the coast where we know the ice is well over a mile thick. A mile thick. All gone, right? So global warming had already started when Vancouver was here. Okay. So anyway, <clears throat> one of the things that they did in the, the, the second year was they found out that the the, water, the uh, climate here was uh, it was still very wet and, and, and windy and what have you. And life in the boats when you're away for two or three weeks at a time on the boats wasn't very comfortable. And so they actually made these these canopies to go over over the ships because sometimes. They couldn't even get on shore to camp for the night. They would actually have to sleep in the boats. Pretty uncomfortable stuff. <coughs> Kitimat, where the, uh, where the big... Uh, um, uh, aluminum. Aluminum smelter is. And just below there um, is a place called Jesse Falls. Vancouver spent the night on Jesse Falls. And I've actually shown here um, young Bishop and Sykes doing a watercolour painting, because he did a painting of Jesse Falls. <coughs> and so, um, just a, a bit more life on the, life on the coast. And it's a, it's a beautiful little spot, actually, and there's a big lake up on the, up on the top. <coughs> um, another name, Captain Brown. Um, we're, we're up at um, Prince Rupert, 
And uh, off Prince Rupert, there is a, there's a passage that goes out through all the islands. It's called Brown's Passage. Uh, where do you get a name, Brown's Passage? Not, if you go up there on a cruise ship or all the deep sea ships that go in and out of the port, they all have to go in and out of Brown's Passage. Brown's Passage was named after Captain Brown, who was a, who was a British uh, trader who had just arrived on the coast. And uh, uh, as Vancouver sailed in, his, his boat, ships were at anchor over here in Vancouver. Uh, he rode out to meet Vancouver. Turned out that uh, he wasn't a very nice guy. Um, uh, it, there were a couple of occasions when the natives didn't trade the way he wanted. They were asking for more than he was prepared to give them. And so to make them understand that he meant business, he cannonaded the, the village. Uh, not, uh, not a nice thing to do at all. So um, um, uh, I don't know what happened to him, but I, I hope he got his others. <coughs> um, we're now back up, we're now up into Alaska, and um, this is uh, up in the top of the Bean Canal, and there's a place there called uh, Escape Point. Now the story here is that uh, Vancouver had been trading with the natives from the village um, the day before, peacefully, and um, they expected to do the same thing the following day, and this huge 90-foot canoe came out, uh, loaded with warriors and with this old woman standing in the stern. <coughs> And this old woman um, started to incite one of, the, one of the young chiefs to steal firearms that were hanging in the canopy. Now, of course, Vancouver couldn't have this and, um, and had to try and extricate himself. And they, they, they opened fire on the natives, killing a few of them. And um, the, the natives turned the canoe on its side uh, to protect themselves, swam ashore, climbed up on here and started throwing rocks down onto, onto Vancouver. He was able to get away, and, uh, and that's why he named his point Escape Point. <coughs> the village, he, he gave that a real good name. He called it Traitor's Cove. Traitor's Cove. Traitor's Cove. But this was one of only two incidents that Vancouver had on the whole coast. Uh, where, where he had, as he said, um, I, I, had, I had hoped to, to conduct the, the full voyage without firing a shot in anger. This is one of the few occasions when I'm afraid he had to. <clears throat> um, a rather intriguing spot, if anybody's been up, to, up there on the cruise ship, uh, uh, you can also go into the East Bean Canal. And in the middle of the East Bean Canal is this rock. And Vancouver named it the New Edistone Rock because from a distance it looked like the Edistone Lighthouse from the south of England. <laughs> what it is, it's the center cone of an old volcano. It's a volcanic uh, uh, cone of an old uh, volcano. And Vancouver landed on this, on this little island for breakfast and the natives, some of the natives came to, came to meet him. And um, they tried to get him to go and visit their, their village, but because of the problem he had the day before, <coughs> he declined. But uh, this, this up in here, these are the misty fields. If you've been up there, you may have flown, flown in from Ketchikan, and you go into the misty fields. So that's, that's where that is. I see encounter now. On the last day on their return from Hawaii, they, they went up, as they said, to Cook Inlet, right up at the top of Alaska, and then they sailed down. When they sailed down, they came in around Cape Albany, and, um, and when they went in, they, um, sorry, Cape Spencer, when they went in around Cape Spencer, in the middle of the night, they ran into what they thought for a minute was rocks, because it was what they called dirty ice, that's ice that's covered in sand and shingle and rocks, <coughs> and, um, and in, the, in the dark it looked like, like rocks, then they discovered it was ice. It was coming out of, the, of what he named Icy Strait, all the ice, and of course that is where Glacier Bay is and, and several of the other glaciers that come down in there. Glacier Bay did not exist when Vancouver went there. It did not exist because the ice was right down to Icy Strait. It was just beginning, it was just a very slight indentation where it is now. And last time I was up there, um, I went 68 miles to the, to the ice field. 
or 68 miles. That's how far it's gone back in, in 200 years. Mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> now this is the last, the last slide, and um, this is actually Cape Albany. Now, on the, on they, they had now completed their chart of the Pacific Northwest, right? Three summers, uh, and um, they, they went into a bay just north of here, on the inside, which he named Port Conclusion, because that is where he concluded his survey. Aren't these wonderful names? <laughs> um, anyway, they, had, they got uh, waylaid in, in Port Conclusion by a massive storm that was coming in off the Pacific. So it was too dangerous to try and get out, and so they were, they were stuck there for two weeks waiting for this storm to, to, to blow out. Finally they did, they managed to get out and, they, and they're off Cape Albany and we've got this old seas running from this huge storm. And when they, they got off Cape Albany and the wind went completely flat calm. But of course the old sea is still running. It takes days for that to go down. <clears throat> and they suddenly realized that the current was pushing the ships onto Cape Albany. Five years away and you're going to lose your ship on Cape Albany and no Coast Guard to come and help me and, you know, you know. And so what they did, the only thing they could do, lowered the boats and towed for 12 hours. <coughs> towed the ships for 12 hours, trying to hold, it, to hold them off the rocks in these conditions. Okay. When they recovered the boats, finally, when the wind did come up and they recovered the boats, um, one of the seamen fell over the side, cracked his head on the, on the side, was drowned and lost. His name was Abel Seaman Wooden. Abel Seaman Wooden. And so Vancouver named that rock Wooden Rock. And it's still known as Wooden Rock. So rocks aren't the wood made of rocks, some of them made of wood. So, um, oh, well, that's a shot of somebody I know. <laughs> <coughs> and that is my, that, this is the boat that we, we explore the whole coast on. And uh, in a big refit right now, following an accident. But uh, we do, we actually do search and rescue in the area. And uh, we, help, we help a lot of people out here in the, in the, um, in the waters off, off, from Port Roberts right the way up to Vancouver and up the Fraser Road. So, it was actually built in Pearl Harbor in 1944. It was actually used by Admiral Nivis. It was on two aircraft carriers. So, a little bit of history there as well. What do you call your boat? It's called the Seaston Lifeboat because we do lifeboat duty. Okay. We've done 871 rescues with that boat. Wow. Yes. So, that is my presentation.